My name is Michael Dexter. Welcome to BSD CAN. And my talk is about FreeBSD and Windows environments. I will somewhat talk to my slides because some people are better at reading than listening. Some people may have audio trouble, so I'll just do a hybrid. I am open to questions midstream, so feel free to jump in and, and prod and heckle. So I do have a paper out there, and I encourage you to read it because both the talk and the paper are a good tutorial. It might even become a tutorial someday because this gets very hands-on and very actionable. Many of my talks have been theoretical over the years and things are really hitting the road here. So the full title is FreeBSD is uniquely positioned to help deploy, virtualize, and serve Microsoft Windows production environments. So the URL to the paper is there. It's findable at callfortesting.org. So an introduction, this all started with a book. Some of you may remember Ted Middlestat's FreeBSD Corporate Networkers Guide. This was around 2000 when JL landed. And he wrote the book, literally and metaphorically, and Michael W. Lucas tells me he was terrified that Ted would keep at it and suck the oxygen out of the room. <laughs> and fortunately, there was oxygen left, and Michael Lucas has done very well filling in the blanks and touching on a lot of these topics. So a few things have changed since 2000. Remember, Jail had just arrived, thank you, PHK. SMP was just skidding onto the scene. Novel concepts like 64-bit addressing were arriving and the move to UEFI GPT and LibXO UCL came along and that's had some successes and somewhat under adoption in places. Package came along. Who remembers, you know, was it also package before that and pa package add and, da, 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 and some of the syntax is similar but different. It does some wonderful things. Packet filter came in from OpenBSD, not to mention Dtrace and ZFS from Solaris, and Beehive and Zen. And show of hands, who knows that FreeBSD is a somewhat capable Zen platform? I've been working with Roger to make that happen. We have two hands out of several, but it's, it's a thing, and it's an underappreciated thing, especially with all the recent news in hypervisors. So, a few things have not changed. The license, the copyright more accurately, just give, give credit where credit is due. From there, just try to be nice. User source, build world objects, you run a few commands. We now have lots and lots of cores, which makes that a lot faster than it used to be. I remember the good old days. People were just building world 24-7 because that's how we got from point A to point B. It is still a Unix environment. It is still POSIX-ish, it is still SUS-ish. It's, it's, if you're familiar with Unix, the orientation is not that difficult. We still have NFS, love it or hate it, SSH. Um, everyone uses that 24-7, even if they love to beat up on BSDs. Thank you, OpenBSD, for that. You've done a great job with that. Control-T, it's in Solaris land. It's in BSD land, it's not elsewhere. Is anyone not familiar with Control-T? No hands, awesome. Uh, and the BSD cons. We have tragically lost VBSD con and meet BSD to the pandemic, but hopefully they'll be back in some form. They were awesome, but we have a cadence of Asia, Ottawa, and Europe. So I, I hope to see you there, and I've seen many of you there. So a few things have changed in the last year. A lot is going on, and it's easy to miss some of it. I didn't even realize that the installer is now using BSD Dialog. It is a native BSD license dialog to create little pop-up windows and TUIs and such. And there were a few years back when I checked there were, they were missing parts, simply some little simple stuff that was missing. I looked at the NetBSD one and some folks sat down and brought it home. Thank you for that. Packaged base. That is one of the first things I loved about Red Hat insofar as everything's accounted for. How did this file get here? Well, let's go find out. And RPM hell ergo led me to jails because once you install something, there's no chance of getting it back. So that brought me literally to this stage today, back from 23. Not 03, sorry, 2003. Mount dash T NLFS null fs dash F for a file mount. 
such that if you're crafting a thin jail, you can do things like, I want this one file in there from the host, have a nice day. Game changer for that classic view of a thin jail versus now a package-based one, but that's not fully here. Hopefully it'll be in BSC install sooner rather than later. One that has me very excited is make image makefs-tzfs, zfs up north. That is to make a, a, allow a user to create a root disk image using the release tools. There were a few hiccups in the last two releases and they were, some key bugs were fixed for the upcoming 14.1 release. That should be, I believe, actually, I believe it's building as we speak. So that's a cool one because the VM images, which I'm touching on next, one, are for cloud stuff. Two, they now have root on ZFS. Three, FreeBSD couldn't care less where it's booting. I have a tool that I'll touch on called Imagine that lets you splat that, that VM image to a disk and now, with the bug fix, mirroring it and having a stock system within minutes or seconds. And while BSD Dialog is here, I never want to see an installer again. OpenZFS 2.2.x, there were also a few little rough moments when it landed, but we are just beginning to understand the power of block cloning. Thank you, Powell. Uh, when creating things like jails, you can create one with package base and duplicate it a hundred times in, oh, maybe seconds. It is epic and fascinating. Uh, GPU PCI pass-through, I'll touch on that later. TPM pass-through has arrived, but not yet emulation. We'll get to that. Beehive on ARM64. Those same VM images, as of about a week or two ago, can now be dropped on a disk, dropped on my old Thunder X that Rebecca kindly sent me, and booted. And the same image dropped in as a VM and spun up with Beehive, max 16 vCPUs, as Mark Johnson touched on in the Dev Summit, and you have Beehive on ARM in a few minutes. No special builds, no special copying in files. There's one package it depends on for the U-boot. That's it, it works, it's great. And Samba 419. And Ted's book arguably waited on that all these years, and I'll get to the importance of that simple little release. So, FreeBSD 14 is really good. Um, the, the, the FUD is baffling insofar as it's never been better and it's very powerful. OpenZFS 2.2 is really good with new features landing, often from FreeBSD land. And the thing about Samba 419 onward, it supports function level 2016, which for the most part is modern AD. That took a very long time, it's here, it's very capable. So furthermore, just, just comparing, you know, there are a lot of headlines flying by, just do a search of ZFS and it RAMFS and see lots of posts starting with help. Help, help, I updated the kernel, I'm in pain. Help me now, please. So I would argue, given the integration of FreeBSD and ZFS, given that Illumos is rightfully cherry picking new features from OpenZFS. They're still on their own classic lineage of ZFS, ZFS. Uh, I'd argue FreeBSD is the only true tier one integrated ZFS platform. And there are many other ZFS platforms and I'll touch on those a little later. So uh, when you're producing a product based on ZFS and another OS, you truly need staff release engineers to keep up with the Linux kernel and that's cool and it works out for a lot of vendors but for those of you know, individuals on up, it's great when it works out of the box. So the license has no plan on changing. And similarly, the foundation that, that uh, was mentioned a few times with Kirk and such, it's, it's there, it's continuing, it's doing some very good things. And we're not poised for surprises. We're not, uh, we're not poised for Red Hat declaring itself upstream. It's like, you're a bunch of packages from elsewhere, but no, we're upstream now. Like, sure, okay. Um, from the vendor summit in, uh, I think it was last November in San Jose, thank you Foundation for putting that on. Uh, comments like, there are lots of Linux drivers out there. Quite a few are reference drivers. So you get started, but you may have to kind of bring your own uh, fun to the table. 
I've been doing storage with a certain popular storage appliance based traditionally on FreeBSD. And when you start getting into the higher end with say 100 gig networking, there are just missing fundamental relationships between the kernel and the file system that you can lop off 20% performance from the get-go. There may be tunings that get around that, and I know people are working really hard to fix that, but I really like things that work out of the box and have leveraged muscle memory I've built over decades, thank you very much. And with people adopting it, if they do go that route, can we go from n number of GPL violators to n plus one? Like, okay, that's not the flex you think it is on routers and storage vendors and all these and probably devices within the room. It's like, show me the build environment, show me the code. I see a wireless access point there. I, I wonder if they're complying, don't know. So I'm here to talk about Windows, a technology I have avoided professionally for decades. I've just smugly used my Mac, my BSD, and uh, if I were to capture it, it is the best available implementation of the Win64 API. Many applications need that. Many proprietary engineering applications need that. Business apps, you name it, games, whatever. And then all the clones are, are very uh, all over the map in their faithful representation and re reproduction of that API. So a few things like FreeBSD have not changed. Um, Apple got command, copy, paste, whatever, right back in uh, the late 80s, yet you sit down at PCs and the control key can be in a bunch of places. Like, really? I got arthritis with Beehive because I intuitively used my thumb and then curled it under and <clears throat> So, um, as soon as today, you copy a folder with date stamps and it's like, you didn't need those date stamps. Let's make it today. Like, uh, this is user data. I, I care about, you know, even at what could be forensics. I, I do care. So sorting windows with like files up here and folders down here with missing date stamps because like uh, the others have solved that decades ago. Please just try. Please, please, please. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a GUI for all the things until it isn't, and you find yourself, oh, you just fixed that with a registry hack. But you said it's a server that I manage with a GUI, clicky, clicky, clicky. So there's that. I love how the latest pre-boot environment looks like Windows 7, the same window dressing. It's like, okay, cool, yeah, I saw that, I saw that. <coughs> and they've brilliantly mapped the whole OS to XML so you can like um, configure a system, yet you can't push out an XML file, and of course, the parts they haven't XMLified aren't XMLified. It's like, oh, so you, you always will keep a list of the stuff to do it one way, the stuff to do it another way. PowerShell, I swear someone got a description of a Unix command line over the phone and implemented it from there. Like, okay, so you type these commands and you pipe them together. And so when you want to copy a file, so like, okay, want to copy file is the command. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> it's like, what's with all that? And then some camel case, but it's not actually enforced camel case, so it's, 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 and how many human years have been wasted typing administrator and mistyping it, because you lost the middle I, but you got the first one, and it's like, and around the world, not everyone is a native English speaker. So things like root, love it or hate it, or admin, save time over decades. Thank you very much. So. Okay, so uh, Albert pointed out that Active Directory in German can just start throwing in umlauts, and good luck, <laughs> good luck. And maybe you can have it as a username, but you can't log in with it, is that the problem? There are few places to play it and have to escape stuff. Ah, escaping, yep, yep. Thank you, UTF, WTF-8, or whatever it's called. Okay, uh, a few things have changed. Has anyone sat down at Windows Server lately? The 2025 version has the Windows 11 GUI. That's like their big, big thrust. Now, if you sit down at a desktop, if you go to their store, there are no more backup apps. They've vanished, gone. They created an, an entire ecosystem of backup apps 
and then thought we shall kill them, we will make OneDrive all the things and then Azure for a server. And just pretend none of the others exist. It's kind of disingenuous to a lot of vendors, thank you very much. They use phrases like, your organization's policies do not allow that. I just installed this machine fresh. I, it's me, my installer, my hammer. Just, who, who is this? Who, who is that? Uh, phrases like cloud-based backup, we think you'll like it. Like, this is a computer, it's a, a, a machine that takes numbers and just process them, process them, processes them in long order. Just, no, there's not this feeling of liking some new technology. And fast forward, these headlines write themselves. It's like, okay, headline, Microsoft recall. Is spyware and an obvious target, says security experts. And I love the modern era, just for the, for the record books, it's like image created with, by decrypt using AI. Okay, thank you. So if you haven't been following recall, we'll snapshot your desktop constantly so you can go back in time. You've heard of it, that's, or you have a question? Yes. Yep. So, yes, especially during installation. So the 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 uh, the audience member said, uh, "Windows is great when you unplug networking and." it will aggressively force you to create an on, or use an online user account unless you, at the right time, remove networking. So there's that. So I have concluded that Windows must be contained in various forms and FreeBSD is really good at it in obvious and subtle ways and having OpenZFS always within reach without question, without, oh, being an accidental release engineer, and unfortunately I think that talk was scheduled against this one now, so I can't go see it, but uh, Colin's talk is great. So, let's talk deployment. So, Windows is very end user oriented and withholds what I'd consider pretty essential information about the hardware you're on, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Windows Server, on the other hand, withholds a lot of administrative information from you. It's like, you don't need to know that. You don't need to know the health status of your disks. It's, it's not, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. So, uh, I have simple steps with a new machine to use DMI decode to get serial numbers, to get model numbers, to get RAM module information all within about a second, which is nice, thank you very much. Uh, ACPI dump will let you grab, for example, a Windows key, which remarkably doesn't pop up automatically during installation. Uh, disk info for block sizes and other things, and like which disk do I wanna aim at and which one do I wanna keep. Smart control for disk health, you name it. So starting with a, acquiring a machine, be it new or has data, I profile all that and it's very useful. And it's Unix. If you throw tabs between stuff, you drop it in a spreadsheet and simple stuff like that within seconds versus download a different utility for each of these that might take its time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there is WMIC in Windows. It will cover some of this, bless their hearts, but there's a lot of information I want and I want it quickly. Heaven forbid you have more than one computer to deal with. Maybe you're at a university, go figure. So. Um, hardware secrets, I, I gave a taste of my strategy with this utility, PCHW, like PC hardware information, just, it's real simple, it spits out things like you run uh, a, a TSV collector so that you give it a file name and it just starts giving you information like serial number, like uh, BIOS revision, stay current on your BIOS except when you shouldn't, like trackpads on ThinkPads, thank you very much, uh, CPU information. Often you're following that to see if it's Windows 11 compliant. And you know what do we do with this machine? Uh, how can we repurpose it in the short term and long term? And in an office environment, I've found that machines have had to be repurposed in a hurry. 
as in like right now. So knowing about the machine is really helpful because they all kind of look alike. So um, NVMe drives. Uh, Each drive vendor typically has some utility if you can find it. Da, 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 da. Cutting to the chase. I boot to FreeBSD, run this command, and you can go from a 512 byte emulated drive to 4K native, of course, in one second. Uh, it's not immediately visible. I generally reboot, but a, a kind audience member pointed out that maybe DevCTL would allow you to detach it and reattach it and reassign the driver a bit like under a hypervisor and you don't have to reboot, which on a server with many devices is really unattractive. So things like that, that again can take place in one second completely deterministically makes my day. So yes, that will destroy all your data because it's a low level format. Um, when I get a new machine with Windows pre-installed, uh, the first thing I do is wipe Windows because if you accidentally boot to it, you spend the next 15 minutes watching it boot up and trying to configure itself and then you can hop into a shell and reboot it, and then I just hop into the BIOS, and many of them have a, a, like a Opal or whatever disk wipe. So wipe drives can be very handy, and it's a nice clean starting point. And then you check the health of it, and you make a decision to be continuous with this machine. Who's familiar with CamDD and FreeBSD? The Cam layer, two hands go up. Um, cam and, uh, oh, CamDD, it's, the DD command, that has a slightly different syntax, and I don't think the manual makes it, page makes it super clear that you need file as a prefix to in and out, but I noticed then when, when DDing disks, I got the exact size in bytes as opposed to like rounded up. So suddenly if you use DD, you might get partitioning that is like, oh, uh, uh, corrupt, even though that doesn't mean corrupt typically. So very useful plenty fast, embraces the entire stack. It's native to FreeBSD. Uh, give it a try, and thank you, Chuck, for helping me understand how to use that and use it in anger. Although, in uh, ports, there's uh, DD Rescue. It will repeatedly test and copy, uh, it'll copy and verify success on a disk with a number of retries. If you know you have trouble with the disk, and it will keep track of how far it got. So that if a drive is like overheating and you have to let it cool down and start again, it'll pick up where it left off, it'll retry at whatever specify, whatever increment you specify, and it's proven useful because a lot of this will just heat up and have a nice day and you're done. And so you can't just keep starting from scratch with DD and, or CamDD and off you go. So, uh, raw disk images, I love them because uh, check out my talk on collapsing the stack. Uh, that disk is a bunch of numbers that start at zero and go up to a really big number. That's it. That's if it's fancy NVMe, it's just a namespace. It's a start here, this block size, keep going. So a raw disk image dropped in a ZFS data set can be snapshot and rolled back. I'll touch on some of the really good things you can do with that. And you can typically splat it out to hardware because that disk doesn't know where it is or care. And FreeBSD, to its credit, has been really good about dual UEFI and BIOS boot. And there was talk of it of removing the classic legacy support. And I'm like, well, no, you get it right. You do it better than anyone else, so please, please don't remove that. So uh, it took a while for Gpart to sprout the dash F. You can nuke partitions in an instant. Know what you're doing, be careful, but Windows and Mac really like to hold on to partitions. They really want to protect you from yourself. And uh, it's frustrating as heck, whereas I like tools that run in one second and do exactly what I ask. So there's that. Oh, firmware updating. I wish the industry was better about this with some nifty universal firmware updating tool and you pointed, dropped in a payload and it did the right thing, but no, you're at the mercy of vendors and often Windows or free DOS or something to run a firmware update. I mean, there are obviously UEFI, there are some standards now, but not everybody publishes the stuff in a usable. Correct. They're now UEFI tools, but not everyone's on board with that. Pardon? 
Okay, comment was FreeBSD 14 has a firmware updater. Okay, and do check out Andrew Fresh's talk on his OpenBSD firmware updater and tools and goodies, so there's all that. Okay, so who's taken a laptop and like dropped in their BSD of choice and the first thing it says is like Windows Boot Manager or Ubuntu who aggressively use the EFI variables. Here's how you get rid of them. Again, in a few seconds at a command, you just like, you list them. You nuke the one you want and you need a specific, you know, to delete and the number and it works. It's great, it's, it's just in an instant. All right. So yes, uh, like many things with new technologies, there were incomplete and rough implementations. So some early UEFI might have no notion of that. It'll pretend to work, but still, it's worked well for me. Uh, it gives me, and finally the FreeBSD installer says, you wanna delete these three other FreeBSD mentions? Like, yes you do, <laughs> yes you do. So going deeper. Uh, let's see, you can mount NTFS, NTFS volumes in FreeBSD under Fuse, which has its performance issues, but trust me, that's a thousand times better than nothing. It is delightful when you just need to extract data, preserve it off in ZFS, snapshot it, consider it immutable, hopefully not have to take it to court, but it will do the job. So between the disk imaging, go ahead. And XFAT, yes, correct, and XFAT too. So I'd argue ZFS is the most portable file system out there short of FAT, XFAT, and to some degree NTFS. That's what the world gave us. And it's like, really? <laughs> so mounting SMB shares, uh, there is some in-base support for that. There are talk, discussions going on about updating that. It's also slow, but if you need that data out of there, the tools are within reach for many situations. And then of course, uh, there's the Fuse SMB NetFS. It has bizarre syntax. I don't know what it's inspired by. I've given a snippet here, you can look at the slides. It does work. So there's that. It's, I believe, user space SM Samba from some point in time, but it's, again, better than nothing. So continuing the syntax, it's what, what blew me away is you have this like hosts file with a syntax and that's what you determine a mount with. And so you, you, you fire off the command, send it to mount, and then you do this, so it's not very Unixy, but it works. So in all of that, uh, rsync is still your friend. Uh, it's, I've moved a lot of data with rsync, anyone, anyone in the room? Uh, open rsync from FreeBSD from Kristaps is available, but I believe it's a bit buggy, that needs some love. I think it was waiting on capsicumization, now it, I believe has it, but needs perhaps a little love. Um, and the syntax, I believe, is fully compatible. Ah, BitLocker, um, I believe that's what they, oh, no, CryptoLocker is the bad one. I think yeah, BitLocker is, okay, okay, so. Um, that is great that putting on their almost fitting OpenBSD hat, Windows offers like native disk encryption. That's a very good step in the right direction. The problem is they often don't tell you that it's work, it's enabled and I'll touch on some very terrible things that can happen there. Exactly, that's which I'd prefer to what we're about to talk about. So yes, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get there. But it's the problem that sometimes I get back laptops to colleagues. Yep. And then it's like, why is the disk encryption turned off? So we'll get to that, the, the random disabling of it. But there are tools in BSD and Linux land to mount those volumes. Great. However, um, use it and any encryption with extreme caution. Um, any NAS or Office PC that doesn't tell the user that it's encrypting their data uh, can lead to some really uncomfortable conversations when they're like, well, you know, it's asking for a key. Like, what, what's that even mean? I don't like those calls. So, one, 
some vendors are notorious at wiping out the firmware with an update. So like, oh, new firmware, which I just advocated for, but when that nukes all your keys in the process and you don't know that you're using encryption, very sad face. Uh, as Albert pointed out, occasionally it will turn itself off, just maybe to temporarily do something but not turn it back on. And I can only see it as self-inflicted, free of charge, ransomware with no one to pay. The vendors, and look at the HP forums, uh, like, so sorry, yeah, you, sh you should have known you had it that we shipped it with and, and, well, and. Now it means that you should uh, make a copy of the recovery key to create. It prompts you to create it, but in a machine that ships with it on might not. Because of they want a seamless environment, just a user experience. Yeah, I've never used the ship version. Okay. The comment was he's not used the ship version of Windows, and yes, I agree. And we'll get to actually some nifty tricks there. Uh, so external, I didn't, I might have one here somewhere, but the USB to SATA adapters and NVMe adapters are really helpful. You have the funky old laptop, you don't know if it'll boot, whatever, remove the drive, back when you could remove drives, image it from there, have a nice day. So uh, I touched on the imaging of VM images. Here's some syntax dash Z for ZFS, keep it mounted, and splat it right out to a device because you can quickly go from a cloud image to a bootable system in minutes. I love it, thank you very much. You can aim packages at a mounted FreeBSD root. It does sniffing and says, oh, you look like you're on AMD uh, ARM64 version this, 14. It'll give you the right packages. That is beautiful. So. I touched on how the VM images are boot images. They don't care, I am delighted with that, and Debian ships no cloud, OmniOS ships cloud. I support all of those in Imagine. So here's some example syntax. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Ah. There are flags for Debian and Illumos, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. So I will talk about WinAgin. I, I love terrible names and I was so happy to see the uh, the determinator, or what was it? The deterministic beehive hypervisor at the depths. I'm like, that's a name for me, man. That's that's cool. So, um, as to Albert's point about not using the shipped, uh, the shipped windows. Well, there is something called auto attend XML, which is a whole bunch of XML parameters to make the system more like you want it to be, and. Uh, my first exposure was on this campus with uh, Beehive and UEFI back when poor you know, geo, uh, UEFI support landed and was headless. So you really want RDP working. You really want the SAC running, which is an out of band shell. You want all those things and there's a bunch of stuff you want to turn off, increasingly with all the spyware, you name it. So I have a collection of useful auto unattend files in this repo. Um, it does one step booting in Beehive to run the installer and just do its thing, and then it's ready for a production boot. Uh, I really wish I didn't know this, but I know this, and I'm happy to share it with you. So I've got profiles for Windows 10, 11, 12, through 25. 25 looks a lot like 22 with the, the new 11 GUI. I'm like, okay, quite the flex. Um, no recovery partition, some people swear by them, some people swear at them, the placement is often inconvenient. Uh, <coughs> dropping in a user, and I often go with just a username root so that suddenly SSH keys and other stuff are all happy and yeah, all that. So uh, as I mentioned, RDP and SAC are great for uh, remote access, especially headless, which most Windows 10 and 11 systems don't have a serial port. Most virtual machines have a serial interface, so that console is your friend. Uh, you can turn off the Windows 11 TPM requirements in like minutes. I love it, love it, love it. And finally, um, modern Windows has, of course, OpenSSH and SSHD. They realized that blowing against that wind was not going to be helpful. And uh, well, how did they put it? That's the most like redeployed software on the planet and thank you OpenBSD team for that. We all run some OpenBSD every minute of the day. Good work. Now FreeBSD has 
through XRDP reasonable uh, RDP support, so you can either share out RDP or use it as a client to go reach out to that Windows machine with your FreeBSD laptop or other BSD or Linux laptop. So that is cool. Now, uh, RDP is painfully good insofar as it's proprietary with a bunch of secret sauce that came out of either Citrix or somewhere, but the implementations are pretty good. And you get things like clipboard sharing, but at its maximum, you get like audio, you get like a rather impressive, efficient, remote desktop experience. And there is Romina, which is a pretty good client for it. Um, you can, again, share out, and it's critical that you have the Tiger VNC server, which does a virtual like console and device, and you can hit your Linux, Unix machines with RDP, you can hit your Windows machines, you can have a pretty homogenous, relatively secure environment. That's progress. Let's talk virtualization. How could I not? So Beehive has supported Windows since 2015. Let's see, it was rough at first. There were wonderfully dumb things, like you just need an empty file attached as a CD device so it boots because it wanted that. Okay, fine, you can have it. Um, a lot of those quirks have just gone away. You still want the low pin count device on 31 instead of whatever you chose otherwise. And TPM pass through arrived in 14. That's the trusted platform module, I believe, is that correct? And what that means is for, for BitLocker to completely tie itself to that hardware and separate you from your data if your hardware fails, they've created a lovely little place to store those keys and and in a virtual environment, it's like, okay, there's one. Well, what if we want like 40 VMs with TPM? Well, we need to emulate, and that's coming along. Ah, oh, friends, don't let friends use Windows and just about anything else without OpenZFS. And I will illustrate how you can save hours and dollars and yen and pick your currency of choice. So obviously ransomware attacks, the rollback is really good and um, <clears throat> the Microsoft security history is not the best. User error, they delete data, we all do it. Or applications have a brain fart and delete data and rolling back makes people really happy. OS updates, oh yeah, they, they've been a rough ride lately. I'll get to, of, of these I'll focus on the staged OS and application installation and application data Review. So here's a true story. A client is using a bookkeeping system that is 99% SQL server with an interface. Great, fine. So the, the, the heavy lifting is by a database and you can save that off and bring it back and off you go. Ah, updating. Well, a lot of such systems have like, well, you can only update the data with the new version and this, that, but a lot of us like clean, clean installations. So I found that one can install the old one, update the old one, export the data, roll back to the pre-installation of the application, put in the new version, put in the new updated data, and you're as if you bought it new and started fresh with the latest version. It'll take some experimentation but oh, you'll thank yourself. And if you're not clear, a rollback in ZFS takes like a second. <laughs> it's just beep, beep. So maybe this theme should be wonderful things you can do in one second or less. So that made my life easier because I really didn't want to experiment with different installations and skidding off the rails and hoping the uninstaller works, possibly reinstalling the OS because the installer just littered it with stuff total flashback to RPM hell. No, there are better ways, let's embrace them. So, eyes on the prize. Corvin, who couldn't be here, is working on GPU pass-through for their application. They want the user to see Windows, as they always have. They want the machine automation to see the pretty darn close to real-time FreeBSD kernel doing the real-timey stuff. And I've heard um, DJs and music folks say, you know, that near real time behavior is really good for things like music, which is pretty darn time sensitive, thank you very much. So be it industrial automation or music, time matters. 
So naturally with ZFS, ZFS, so if a machine were to be transparently running FreeBSD and ZFS and appear to be Windows to the user and have a keyboard and mouse and a GPU, so you have meaningful acceleration, and snapshotted and replicated, it can be spun up and backed up, backed up and spun up remotely effortlessly the way we've been replicating, replicating ZFS from day one. Uh, I suppose in these AD environments you can save off home folders and you get really comfortable with reinitializing machines. I like rolling back to exactly where you were and picking up where you left off and moving forward. So to me, that's the future. Friends don't let friends run Windows without ZFS behind the scenes. I'll be experimenting with uh, Philip here on some hardware I brought because we're really close to getting it going. And there are lots of use cases. What was your use ca case for GPU pass-through? Well, I'd like to use it on a different machine. On a very new ThinkPad that is pretty bleeding edge. Uh, always stick a rev back or two. Yes. For gaming, okay. And that was one of the first vocal groups was gaming, which is really close to industrial automation and timing matters. <laughs> timing matters. So uh, that's where I want to be. Let's talk about serving. The power to serve, the FreeBSD motto. Yeah, so um, Windows has been great at Fiber Channel and iSCSI over the network. It's tolerant. You can even like reboot TrueNAS running iSCSI to Windows and it is booted from it and it's patient and it waits till it comes back and it picks up where it left off. Because SIFS was so terrible, they had to have a block format over the wire because their own file level protocol was arguably still is problematic. But uh, fortunately, FreeBSD has done heavy lifting on iSCSI and Fiber Channel, believe it or not, for a very long time and their vendors who move petabytes, exabytes through it. So it's proven technology. Here's a ridiculously simple example you can try on your laptop. You make a disk image. You share it out with a real simple ctl.conf cam target layer, I believe is a spell out of that, and uh, point at it and announce it with all these. My one concern with iSCSI is just the naming. Uh, it, it makes sense, but I want something short and then you can validate the config, launch it, and in debug mode, you get to see it on screen and see connections and all that. Start any experiment in debug hands-on mode, especially Beehive, just run it at the command line and then automate it. Don't reverse that process, is my suggestion. And just go do your discovery from Windows. It's, I'd argue the Windows iSCSI client uh, initiator is ridiculously useful. And it, it works or it doesn't. There's not a whole lot of like, eh, it's, it's, it's Johnny on the spot. So, yeah, fun fact. I've shared that image off to Windows. I have formatted it NTFS with the standard utilities. I brought it back and round tripped it with the NTFS G3 fuse based tools. Those are standard protocols. They behave as expected. I like that. Thank you very much. And you may have to tweak the VFS, ZFS, vol mode property as needed. Sometimes it masks it from the OS, sometimes it masks it from cam, it does various stuff, so check that out. Another fun fact, um, Windows has NFS, client and server. Someone somewhere out there got it working and I salute them. Let's talk Samba. <laughs> so yeah, um, who recalls the EU kerfuffle over Samba never, and Microsoft never quite documenting the protocol. It's like kind of, yeah, here's some docs. Sure, this napkin will tell you. Well, uh, they got in trouble and got pressure from the EU and Microsoft was forced to actually share the protocol information and Samba has become quite good. And like iSCSI on FreeBSD, exabytes, I suppose, have been pushed through Samba on FreeBSD. Without question, I've seen it for a decade. It's, it worked, <laughs> it works very well. Um, the classic three commandments, uh, set that domain controller as your DNS server or there will be pain and suffering. 
uh, keep all your time in saying NTP is your friend. And there are all these nifty like GPS based Raspberry Pi NTP servers you can like drop on your network. Go play with those and they're the best company name ever. I believe it's Time Machines and they have devices for your like network rack with time servers. Go check them out. Um, and then if it's not those two things, it's deep in the weeds. But fortunately, those first two issues solve most. So uh, thank you, Daniel, and we should talk more about this. So you can provision, cutting to the chase, a functional level 2016 SMB server without a lot of trouble. The documentation is terrible. I've worked to automate it with this tool for my purposes and hope to grow upon that. But that desktop just says, hi, I'm, happy. I'm ready to join, join the collective, and it's the real deal. And 2016 was a critical milestone which arrived with Samba.19. And I, as the moment all the documentation catches up, I think we'll be pleasantly surprised what things can be done for very little cost. Shower thought. So anyone from Germany or Vienna or other? I'm looking at you, Albert. So I only hear whining about power costs and electrical costs. And seemingly, no matter how much green energy they produce, the more they pay. So uh, things like ARM64 Samba sharing, hugely popular on a Raspberry Pi and a basement, et cetera, et cetera. Fast forward to today, suddenly multi-core ARM64 with Samba may very well be the solution you're after with ZFS. And this just occurred to me, how, how is ZFS ARM for Linux? Just anyone who's using it? Show of hands. Thank you, <laughs> none. <laughs> so power constrained, ARM's your friend. Field notes, getting into tutorial territory. Here are a whole bunch of fun freebies. Uh, Thank you, Daniel. Daniel's in the room. Daniel produced Zelta. Zelta has been described, may I? Described by a FreeBSD co-founder as the greatest backup utility he's used in his 40-something years. Zelta is awk-based such that if your other machine has ZFS but not the tool of choice, it uses Unix tools and says, OK, check this, check that, send on over. It has various modes of like, oh no, grab the most recent snapshot, this machine is burning down, or preserve history, or policies, you name it. And a huge key subtle point to all those hecklers are like, oh, another replication tool, har har. Uh, I believe the position is that if you're using force, to force delete backups to catch up with them, you failed, you've done it wrong. Uh, you do not want to force destroy your data ever when you're in the data preservation game. And I get a nod from Lucas. Any other quick comments, Daniel, or is that close enough? And come to his talk, I believe, today in the same room. Come to, your, come to the talk. There's the advertisement. So moving on, I'll punch through these and we might be, uh, don't worry, wrapping up, up to all the, okay. So MAC addresses are your friend. Uh, get in the habit of setting them for virtual machines. Just they can follow you around the world and uh, DCH gave a great talk in Coimbra about his MySQL databases in containers and with zero tier. And it's like, they don't care where they show up on the internet. They're, they're happy, it's like, okay. So, and I know lunch is here, so I, I'll, I'll hopefully not punch too far into that. Um, uh, when you're headless and like dealing with GPU pass-through, you know, ARP listings of whose your neighbors are can be really helpful, especially if you know the address of the VM, because you think, well, I got far enough to get networking and nothing else. Well, that's, that's, that's progress. And oh, Proxmox, uh, I'm on the public record saying they know enough about ZFS to be dangerous. Why would you want disk replacement? I don't, I don't know, I don't know. So in Taipei, trying to get GPU pass through working to my liking, I just blasted out hip scan. Maybe you've heard of angry IP scanner. Here's happy IP scanner. It uses in-base tools and it's really fast. So it just goes, brrr, runs through your subnet and spits out the ports I've you know, specified. You can easily fix that. Sitting down to a Windows machine that's AD joined, you can put this syntax in, dot backslash in the username and get the local user login rather than it constantly prodding for uh, the domain. 
please join the calls. Anyone here, Daniel, Chuck? Uh, the, the production user calls have really touched a nerve. They sprouted out of the Beehive developer calls, but we'd talk about developer stuff and then ZFS for two hours. Well, fast forward, they started talking about jail, which was really pent up, and some really good features have come out of that, those multi-hour head poundings between smart people. So check that out. Let's look to the future. I was the first, confirmed by, uh, by Jorgen, the first user of open ZFS on Windows on real hardware. He had worked entirely in virtual machines, rightfully so. This right here. This is the plumbing to do, I believe it was root on ButterFS in Windows. I don't want that, but it maps out how to do root on ZFS. Who has a weekend or two to blow and is familiar with these things? Because that's not me, it's above my pay grade. I, yes. Okay, I would love to see that because the moment you get Windows root on ZFS, all the backing up, yeah, send, right, and rollback, and game over. So I look forward to that. Although, what's with like EFI partitions? It's like, what, at 32? Like, uh, I think we've yeah. come a, a little further, guys. Oh, <laughs> no, that's in the spec. I know, it's in the spec, but it's a terrible thing to put in the spec. So anyway, um, find your physical drive name, use familiar commands, and wow, at the ZFS Developer Summit, the moment he did that, people thought he was trolling him. He was like, Z pull, Z pull that EXE. He's like, ah, you're kidding, man. And he's like, nope, here we go. And so standard A shift, of course, case insensitivity is Windows, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you, everyone. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> yes? What I do is every single machine I come across, before anything, it gets imaged, dropped on ZFS on an actual array with redundancy, and snapshotted. Before anything. And you never know which old machine, oh no, had that, that, that one utility we used to update the cutting table thing. Well, you know, this one little silly thing, or that reprograms the, the time card machine, and we forgot that Jane did it and it was on her machine, blah, 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 blah. So, um, uh, always be prepared to be asked into a courtroom. <laughs> so, when I image machines, I, again, put them on ZFS, I snapshot them, back them up, and then you know that that's what it looked like at that point in time. This is not a booted machine, it's just the, the image as it was, and so, when you say you have that utility that ran on Windows 7 and you, because Windows is Windows, it might work on the latest version and you wanna try the new OS with the same old utility installation and just pray, the rollback is essential. It's like, oop, not that way, let's try this, let's try this, let's jump from seven to 11, not through 10, and you know, all those games. Um, so I just do a raw disk image. ZFS gives you compression for free. So don't worry about QCOW2 with copy on write and with compression and snapshotting and all that. No, ZFS just flushes that. It was great at the time. That's cool, it's a great peak at the future. ZFS gives us all of that, free of charge. And so uh, that's my suggestion. The challenge there is jumping from legacy BIOS firmware boot to UEFI. Windows has its own tool, people are pretty happy with it. There's something called AOMI, I believe, that lets you do some of that. Do those steps one by one, if you're like changing drive size and moving a recovery partition, do one operation, reboot, do it again. Don't try to do all the things at once. And you may find yourself checking offsets on partitions and DDing off, cam DDing, DDing, DDing off, 
the recovery partition. You set it aside, you calculate a partition table in your head, you prototype it with MD devices, and then drop it in in place. Once you start seeing that the patterns are just a bunch of numbers on a line and, and block sizes and sometimes getting those right, you're in control. That's, that's what I'm so happy with is that you, you have it by the whatever anatomy you want for your metaphor. So other questions? You have it by the? By the kernel. You have it by the kernel. Thank you. Thank you. That is safe for work. Other questions? Other experiences? Other fun horror stories and workarounds? Thank you, everyone. <laughs>